Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Drew Meredith from Moral Partners. Here we are again. How are you, mate? Good, mate. It's um, been a long time, about a week. Um, not much has happened in markets, but we've got plenty to talk about. We've got six ideas to bring to the table, which is a lot to cover in. We generally say half an hour, but it ended up being considerably longer than that. Um, we've got a good mix. We've got small caps. We've got large caps. We've got a fund in here. So it's just kind of going to mix it up as we go. Um, because there's six ideas and we do want to be as succinct as possible, mate, why don't you kick us off with your uh, first idea and also tell us a little bit about a little bit about how you analyze this as a position for clients portfolios yes yeah, sounds good so i'll start with a it's an unlisted managed fund um which uh, i think a lot of people know what an etf or an lic is this is the the version of that where you have to apply via a form and then if you want your money back you also apply via a form um, without going into the detail. The good old days. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it is getting a bit better. So there's different ways to do it without a form. Um, uh, but basically, managed fund works the same as everything else. You employ a manager who then picks various stocks, probably have exposure to 40, 40 to 60 stocks uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and we kind of have four main things we look at. When we're, when we're trying to find a manager, we think uh, there's certain things that we can do well, but, and similar to yourself, there's certain things you know, but when it's something you don't have enough knowledge on or even enough time to cover, you find someone who is really good at that uh, and engage them to assist mm. you. So that's the first thing, which is you need someone with a competitive advantage. There's a lot of managers who try and be everything to everyone. So you need to pick someone who is specific on a certain sector. It could be technology. It could be digital transformation. It could be small caps. It could be income. Uh, the second thing we look at is experience. Uh, so sure. experience running their own, running their own uh, strategy or running the same version of the strategy, maybe at a bigger employer. A lot of these guys want to go out on their own so they can actually be the old fashioned word of skin in the game where you're actually rewarded and you're invested in your own fund. Uh, Big number three is probably the big one. There's a lot of new managers and the group has to be well resourced. Uh, we see a lot of key person risk where there's just one person and an analyst. I know you've got to start somewhere, um, but one person, if they get hit by a car or something, that's always, <laughs> without being negative, uh, yep. that, that's it. Yeah, you can get your money out quickly. Um, you always can. Uh, that's a big uh, kind of misunderstanding with funds. And the last thing is the ratios we look at. Uh, so same as the way you'd look at a PE ratio or a dividend yield, we look at two for funds in particular. Uh, one's tracking area, error, sorry, tracking error, which mm -hmm. is the similarity to the benchmark in terms of returns. So you want it to be different, right? Exactly. If your tracking error is zero, it looks a lot like the benchmark. It's holding the same uh, same uh, stocks as, say, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. Uh, so you want it higher, the better. And then the other one is active share, which are effectively showing you the same thing. Active share is showing you how different it is from its benchmark in, a, in percentage terms. How about, how about the sharp ratio? Do you ever look at sharp ratios? We do a little bit. There's another information ratio that comes on top of the sharp ratio. Mm. Uh, we've kind of found active share combined with portfolio turnover as being more powerful. Uh, so turnover being how often the shares in the portfolio are bought and sold. Mm. Um, but uh, okay. as, as with everything, there's, there's so many ratios to look at. <laughs> there is, yeah. Really, if, you, you know, if you're paying an active manager, you want them to be a lot different to the index. Otherwise, you could buy, buy the ETF. Mm. So, uh, so, so now that you've given us this overview, which is really valuable for a lot of people to have no idea when they're looking at fund managers, really, they just get sold on the idea rather than actually critiquing it now that you've given us that what's the fund 
So the fund is Munro Partners uh, Global Growth Fund, mm -hmm. uh, run by a guy called Nick Griffin. Um, he had one of the best stock tips at the Hearts and Minds conference every year, it seems. He, he gets one of the best. Uh, it's one of the stocks that's in my portfolio. I'm an investor in the fund as well. Uh, in, our, in our view, or in my view, he's one of the best technology investors in, in Australia, um, potentially the world as well. So it's a long, short fund. Uh, and he's probably got the best understanding of the digital transformation that's been occurring across the world for the last five or 10 years. Uh, he spent time at K2, uh, another international equity manager before starting in 2016. Um, and some of the biggest names, he, he identified the Amazons, the Alibabas, the Nvidias, uh, the esports sector, which we discussed last week, mm -hmm. uh, not six months ago, three or four years ago. Uh, I think he had Activision in the portfolio when he first started uh, in 2016. So he's been very sharp on identifying the digital themes that are occurring um, and actively trading into and out of them. Uh, I think, have you seen the spoken to him? On no, I haven't, so before? I, you haven't done Nick before? I, rec I feel like he's going to be someone that's can appear on the show soon. Um, yeah. I'd love to have him on. Yep. Uh, I, 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 like I've heard of him and I know of him by reputation having read his stuff and, um, you just never had the pleasure of speaking to him. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's just grown from scratch. I think he had about 50 or hundred million when they started in 2016, they're up to about 2 billion in assets now. And the one thing being long short, that means they, they can take short positions in companies they don't like, and they can also take insurance. So buying puts on the S and P 500, if you're buying a put, it means you're, you're protected. If the S and P falls, mm. it's a glo global equity strategy, go back a step. Uh, and that was most impressive to us. And it kind of aligns with that skin in the game is in March, the fund was up when pretty much every other strategy in the country uh, or every other global equity fund was down. So it was up 1.3% in March. Uh, and that was two reasons. One, he had um, puts on the S&P, but he had also been shorting the oil and gas sector. Uh, uh, right, okay. And couldn't have been perfect timing an oil price war broke out at the same time that the market around the world was collapsing for due to coronavirus. So. <laughs> yeah, great. He, um, he's definitely an impressive, impressive operator. Um, question for you. When you look at um, active managers for the, the client's portfolios or even your own portfolio, is alignment for you also um, a matter of them actually investing in their fund? So do you take that into account? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And a substantial amount too. One, you want them to be owning the company and, and the company being majority employee owned. So the, the funds management company. Uh, but you also want to make sure them and their staff are all investing, not just their bonuses, but a significant mm -hmm. portion of their wealth in there. What I find with a lot of good managers is that they reward their analysts by giving them bonuses that are actually units back in the fund. So yeah. And they're, tip, they're typically best over like one, two or three years. So it, they don't just get a massive bonus, goes into the unit that it, as units in the fund and then they can withdraw them for cash. It actually has to stay in there for three years, which then incentivizes them to just hang around and invest for the long term and all those things. I think it's a really creative and important way to do it. Um, that's, it's, what, mm -hmm. that's what kind of protects it uh, or what, what ensures they're aligned when markets are crashing, you know, they want, they want to protect every dollar because their money's in there. That's it. As, even as analysts working on the team, right? You are passionate about protecting the portfolio. You're going to do everything you can. Not just outperforming the benchmark. Um, mm. And that's a, that's a really important thing. I think, you know, it's the same as if you'd have, if you're looking for companies, you want CEOs that are rewarded or own shares already in the companies that they manage. And it's the same, same thing for fund managers. Um, yeah, definitely. So that's, a really interesting one. We haven't actually talked about any funds on the show so far. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about is like classic no points for originality, Drew. I'm starting at the top, probably the top, um, one of the top three companies in the world in terms of market cap anyway, and that's Apple. It's a company that I've held for a long time and I continue to hold. And the basic reason for it is that Apple is completely transforming itself. It is totally changing away from being a hardware business where it sells you know physical things that you can pick up to um we've talked about cloud and the and the cloud adoption cycle throughout the world and moving towards software so once you go mac you never go back that's kind of the saying that gets thrown around a bit 
Look and, around this room, it's all Mac everywhere. Yeah, that's it. Like, I was very anti-Mac. Um, and then I bought shares and I got endowment bias. No, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> I actually, I was very against, you know, Apple I was probably like the staunchest Android supporter there was. But then, you know, I came across, I got a, I got a Mac and the Mac was great. So I got an iPhone. Then all of a sudden I'm in the iOS ecosystem and it's very sticky. And it's so easy. Everything just works together. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And this is all just comes back to that beautiful design, right? Like when Steve Jobs came back to the business um, John Ivy, I think it is, that was the designer at the time of things like the um, iPhone, iPad, etc. You get what's that? AirPods as well. AirPods, yeah. So this, these are all the newer kind of accessories. And um, what we're going to see, if we could zoom out a bit, is this fundamental shift from hardware, which is great for the business because there's wide margins, there's brand value. But the margins, I believe, are going to get even wider on this thing. So I've got my actual model. You can't see. I've got my model here in front of me, uh, the one that Catherine and I did. And, you know, we're forecasting really aggressive margins out into the future. Like we're, we're talking margins on um, the software component or the services division, as they call it, of up to 70%, 80%. So, and that's because this thing, I believe, has the potential to just keep ramping for the next few years. And even if iPhone sales... Um, don't grow like they did maybe say five years ago. Um, maybe the exception to that is the new 5G iPhone, which is what they call a super cycle where people en masse upgrade. Um, yeah. But if you, if you would ex exclude the impacts of that, there's still going to be this fundamental shift towards services. So things like the new Apple bundles where you can get, um, you can get your news app, you can get subscriptions, you can get um, iCloud storage. Um, I feel like I'm, like a, I'm a BDM app or right now. Um, they, don't, that, they don't have any, that's how they... <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's, they just rely on all of us to do a good job for them. Yeah. But if you can do all that, and I think that's the future of Apple. I think, yes, it's got this fantastic cash cow in hardware and it's got a huge amount of cash on the balance sheet. But despite all of that, it's still growing into a business that is even more profitable. Um, you what know, sort of PE are they on at the moment? Oh, you're, you're testing me now, Drew, but they've just... Uh, it's, not even, it's not even that excessive. It's... No, no, no. And the thing is, I think what a lot of people miss with PE ratios is if I'm um, just going off the one on Google finance, uh, which is always not, not the best measure. It says uh, 32, but it's growing quickly. And I think this is going to grow, grow quickly. It, it hasn't grown quickly over the last two to three years because it's been transitioning. But I think in time that shift away from unit sales, which is something that analysts got in a tizzy about when they stopped reporting to number of iOS devices installed and active. I think that's a much better measure because once they're on, in the, the software ecosystem, then they start using more of the software, then they start paying for the software and it becomes this vicious thing. But 32 times earnings um, exclude, you know, $200 million of cash. Um, it's got a bit of debt there too. And um, sorry, not 200 million, 200 billion. Um, and you get, you know, that PE ratio drops down. But I think in a low growth world through, you know, I've said this before, Apple's probably safer as a business. It's probably stronger than some countries. And, um, it's, a, and don't get me wrong, there's still risks. Like, I don't think they're going to win the home battle. I don't think, you know, when you get connected homes, I don't think, I think yeah. Amazon and Google have got that sewn up, to be honest. But, um, and, you know, there are other risks that come with owning an overseas stock. But I think it's got financial flexibility. It's got a growing services division um, and it pays a modest dividend. So um, for me, Apple, even though it's one of the biggest companies in the world, I would say it's, um, it's a good blue chip company to own. Yeah, I just randomly get invoices for something I've signed up for and tend to forget about. Uh, they actually run, uh, they're on a, I mean, a bit of a, they're kind of stuck in the middle of the Chinese trade war too, aren't they, with the US, but yeah. not impacting revenue. Um, no. Then that's the thing. So they actually had really good um, sales out of China recently, which is probably the one company that I can think of that actually is operating in China and does a pretty good job of it. Yeah. Um, and so that's obviously a key growth market for them. So if that doesn't kind of, come off, then obviously that dampens your valuation. And so too, you've got to understand where Apple's parts are sourced from and, and where components are built. And that supply chain disruption can also be a massive headache for them. I know, I don't know if this is directly related to that, but uh, to that trade war kind of issue, but trying to get the new iPad in Australia is almost impossible. I don't know if that's a marketing gimmick or if it's just, you just, that it's not available, but um, we've been trying to get one for a long time and they're very, very hard to come by. Um, and, you know, if you have supply chain disruptions, that can be, I guess, the roadblock that's put in front of you. 
They anyway, tracked, uh, they internalizing their chips. Was yes, that one of the yes. big from Intel? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're bringing it all in house. It's going to be a transition period, but um, again, it's just kind of that Apple make it, wanting to make things better, I guess. Yeah. Um, it does create a few issues and since shockwaves across the industry, particularly in semiconductors, but um, really interesting business, even though it's quite large, you know, I think for Australian investors, if you don't have exposure to overseas markets via an ETF or, or something like a, an Apple or something like that, I think you're missing a lot of the party that goes on in, in, in markets. So for me, I'm quite happy to have this exposure. You said to me before that, oh, you, <laughs> I think you hate blue chips. But I get, most of my blue, I get most of my blue chip exposure from the US rather, than, yeah, rather than here in Australia because I still find them very innovative businesses. Yeah, so that's, that's one on one. That's one on one. Obviously, very bullish, too bullish probably. How about you, mate? You've got another great US company. I'm going deep value here. Uh, I own this one still. I, I think I bought it reasonably well. Uh, Walt Disney Co. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just got off. I was working as well, watching the... Sure uh, the NBA uh, on ESPN owned by Walt Disney mm -hmm. and played at Walt Disney world in Florida where they've created their bubble, <laughs> uh, the, the NBA bubble. So yeah, Walt, uh, Walt Disney, it's not just the theme parks. Uh, While well, that is a large portion, they own, you know, TV networks. They bought 20th century Fox from news mm -hmm. Corp last year. They own basically our view is, uh, you know, Apple's great at services. Netflix is great at subscribers. Amazon's great at subscri subscribers, but you need to own the content. Uh, you need to, otherwise it's incredibly expensive to produce. Uh, Walt Disney basically owns every piece of content you want. Mm. Star Wars, all the offshoots of Star Wars, Marvel, uh, every, every offshoot, I think it's something like in 60 or 70 movie Marvel studios now and all the TV shows that are coming out around it and all the toys mm -hmm. <laughs> come from yep. that. The brands. Yep. Yeah. And pick, if you get Ushies, I've got a toddler. So I've been seeing the Ushies come in that are Disney yep. themed uh, as much as they're plastic um, and they own Pixar. So that's the old toy story uh, producers as well. They've had a bit of a tough run as you'd expect. And they've lost uh, something like four billion dollars from uh covid the share price has dropped from 150 to 85 at the worst and now it's back to about 120 is that because um, of um theme park closures drew pretty much yeah it's yeah. like an 85 percent decline in theme park revenue um yeah, right. they've they because they're a bit globally diversified you know they've got some chinese and uh japanese parks that are starting to reopen mm. um and it's probably compared to other options, theme parks seem to be, you could probably so still socially distance at a theme park yep. uh, compared to, you know, a, a basketball stadium. So it mm. potentially if you're patient, it'll probably take them a year or two to recover fully. Uh, but I kind of see it as a nice value opportunity with this huge Disney plus streaming system and a massive amount of content. Mm. It's one of those businesses. I've seen some really great flow charts and all different types of colorful things that come from analysts who are quite bullish on um, Walt Disney. And it's just incredible to see the stable of brands that they have. Yeah. Not just tangible assets like the, the Disney theme parks. I've been to that one in Japan and Tokyo, by the way. Um, it's enormous. Um, but not, not only that, but, you know, you've got movies, you've got all of the uh, licensing for, for games, for everything that you could pretty much want as a kid. They have it, but also as an adult kid. Um, and the business has just grown from strength to strength. I think the, it's a genuine contender in the, the space for digital streaming or over the top streaming. Yeah. Um, I just don't have a handle on its valuation at the moment. So that's probably why I don't ha have it in my portfolio, but do you have any insights on that? It's a tough one. Cause yeah, I was listening to a, uh, talk the other day and they were saying asking a company like this for visibility on earnings in the next three months, six months, 12 months is yeah. they just can't give it to you. So it's, you know, they're not going to disappear. Um, one kind of good thing they're saying is the media networks. Uh, so the TV, uh, they can play reruns and still get ads. So all production shut down. So that part actually mm -hmm. went up 50% because they don't have to make any content. <laughs> they don't have to do any filming at the moment. And then all the NBA filming is at, um, one place so <laughs> also yeah. makes it easier but that'll change eventually uh yeah i think it's fundamentally cheap but with real risk yeah. um ahead this is where my value bent comes in yeah but if it is a business that for example you know if you look back 50 years 
you can look, this is one of those few companies where you can look back 50 years and, and see that it was a great business back then. It's still a great business now. So this yeah. could be, this could be your opportunity to buy it. The one thing I will note about the share price though, if we're talking about value is it is actually at a point where it was, let me just have a look like late last year. So it's just below that. So um, it has been higher than where it is, but it's not that much lower. But if you're looking for value, it's got maybe a dividend yield, something like that. It's well worth a, a second look, I reckon. Yeah, they did cut their dividend, but I'm sure it'll come back quickly. And yeah. then they did bring in uh, your 20th Century Fox. So that's kind of made their revenue look bigger, but mm. no real benefit from it yet. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good business, mate. It's not one that I, I own, but um, I'm going to transition to another quality company, bring it back to Australia, which is um, Zero. So um, it's probably one of Australia's blue chips now. I was kind of trying to go for a small cap, mid cap, large cap. Um, Zero is probably one of Australia's, even though it came from New Zealand, we'll claim it. Um, one, of, one of Australia's blue chips um, does cloud accounting software. So out and out the leader here in Australia, you know, I, I don't know many people that use the alternatives in Australia for, for accounting software. Um, it effectively just has created this tremendous infrastructure or backbone for third party developers to plug their um, financial software into and run off the Xero platform and then bookkeepers and accountants and even people like me. Well, I don't, do you use Xero? Yeah, we use Xero. Yeah. Um, you know, you can scan your re receipts while you're sitting at the airport when we used to be at an airport. Um, <laughs> but yeah, all but those simple things. Yeah. And you can just, it's so easy to manage employees, superannuation, payroll, whatever, all that stuff can go through zero. And um, it's now become the default system. And what we've seen is that for many years as a, as a company on the stock market, people have kind of disregarded it because they thought, you know, this business is not profitable. How can it be valuable? I mean, you only need to look at great examples like Amazon, probably extreme examples, but you can see examples in the past where if a business is growing rapidly, you don't want it to be profitable necessarily, maybe just marginally break even. So it doesn't require a heap of external capital, but you don't want it to pay a dividend. You don't want it to do all that sort of stuff because it can invest back into the growth engine that it has. And so zero has done that. It's probably one in every single market that it has begun to compete in. Maybe the exception, I think early days still is the U S. So I think with this, different, different this, tax jurisdictions and that it's harder. They seem to take, uh, spend a fair bit of time changing their system for every country, which you have to do because the tax system is very different. But a lot of the competitors just try and plug and play, I think. Yeah. Whereas you need, you need to, the nuances of super guarantee, which don't occur in any other country, are very different to hmm. the US social security or things like that. So, yeah. And that's the thing, uh, particularly in the US, where you have, imagine an employee in one state lives in another state pays taxes in one area has to do something in another area has different, you know, workplace laws. Or it's so complex that um, I think that's where Intuit who owns um, QuickBooks in the U S they're the default, um, I guess, accounting software provider over there. And they're already, they already have that incumbency. So they have that presence in, in bit small business and medium business. Yeah. But that's, you know, just excluding the, the U S case zero is dominating in the UK. It is dominating here in Australia. It is already dominated in its native New Zealand. And I think what we're, what we're seeing now is the business moving to cash flow break even or well beyond that. At the same time, it's looking for acquisition opportunities and releasing complementary products that effectively take the average revenue per user from, you know, $1 to $1.10 or $1.20. What's important is that that's just, those are just round figures, but what's important to know is that, a lot of those add-ons and those extras that you get in your zero account is pretty much just free money for zero because they've already built the infrastructure. You just yeah. pay more revenue because you want an extra widget. And that is where we're, this is where we're starting to see the true power of zero and the pricing power. The big caveat on this, of course, Drew, is what happens to small business over the next 12 to 24 months globally. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, we might get a buying opportunity because zero stock, if I just get it up now, I don't know what it's it is. It's all time highs recently, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. So if we look at the last, well, what was it? Last month, it was, or earlier this month, $103 all time high. It's Australian dollars. So, you know, it's not exactly che the cheapest it's ever been at a time when there's probably the most uncertainty, to be honest. 
So our valuation, if I dive into that again, um, our, our bull case, so our absolute most positive case was $121, but our worst case, absolute worst case from COVID was $55. That's quite a range. Our yeah. fair value, which is probably the, the yardstick you want to go off, is 80 to, 80 to $90. So for us, it's slightly above fair value. And how do you pull that value? Um, so what, the way we do it is we multiply like the subscribers in each geographic region by, and then we get the growth rates to forecast forward. Like we take historical growth rates um, and then adjust forward for, for what we assume is going to be the market share in this case out until 2024. Um, and then what we do is we take average revenue per user. So average revenue per user might be a function of just the pure you know, subscription uh, fee or yeah, from yeah. zero. And you, you might factor in things like workflow max or any sort of HR extras that you bolt on to your zero account. And how does that impact the average revenue per user? And then it becomes, sorry to give it technical for everyone, but it becomes <laughs> P times Q. So P meaning price or the average revenue times Q meaning the number of users. So you multiply them two together and that gets your top line, which you then use for your income statement. And you come down and we get to free cash flow eventually through a few more formulas, through a few hoops. But I think what you're trying to get at, Drew, is that it can be quite, with these rapid growth businesses, it can be quite um, up in the air. You know, if you get one forecast too optimistic, it can just blow off in one direction and down the other way. So that's why we run a few scenarios where we say, okay, it's gonna to get to this number of users and then in plan B, it's going to get to this many, plan C, this many. And then we might say ARP or revenue per user is going to be this much, this much, or this much. And then we kind of multiply them together to get a blended, um, I guess, um, base case. I think that's important. I was reading recently, I'm always kind of reading, <laughs> um, <laughs> but the importance of a changing your valuation approach on different companies, like you can't, you can't value that on a PE, it doesn't make a profit. So but it doesn't mean it's not a valuable company. Yeah. Uh, so if, it, if it's a mature company versus a growth company or a middle growth company, then you need to apply a slightly different mm. measure to it. Well, uh, just to go on that, Drew, I'm just looking at Google Finance. Again, not the most accurate <laughs> source of information. It says the PE ratio is 4,532. Yeah, so, who would ever buy that? <laughs> yeah. So um, what I did a few years ago when we recommended zero was... I said, okay, we've got the fixed costs, which we know are unavoidable, but let's imagine that worst case scenario, they had to cut variable costs. So variable costs are things like marketing, sales functions, all that sort of stuff. If they cut that in half, what would happen? And in my mind, what would happen was the business would be profitable. You know, it's, it'd be actually profitable. However, it wouldn't have the growth potential that we see, or it wouldn't have caught up to the growth that we have from today by simply cutting that marketing budget they would have had fewer subscribers. So my point was, was that worst case scenario, it's profitable. So if we operate on that basis, like what's the worst case um, in terms of its spending, then we can put a value on its free cash flow because otherwise it's just negative for forever if you just assume that it's going to be teetering on break even. So that's kind of like how we got to a rule of thumb of how free cash flow positive could this business be or yeah. is it already? And that's a very rough rule of thumb and you kind of have to see through the numbers, but that's how we did it. Hmm. So that's my number two. What about you, mate? Pretty topical again. Uh, it's been a wild ride. I hold, I think I hold all of them today. It's always good talking about the ones you hold because uh, you know them, you should know them <laughs> better than anyone else. <laughs> um, uh, so Zip, Zipco, uh, we talked about a few weeks ago in the midst of the, you know, the craziest run I've ever seen um, in share markets. Uh, I bought it at six dollars after having it at a dollar, selling at four, uh, and then I couldn't help myself to get back in at six. <laughs> it ran to nine and fell back down to six in something like eight weeks. Um, <laughs> I'm just looking at it now. It just looks like Everest is in the middle of this flat patch. Back at six, <laughs> straight up and back down. Yeah, wow. There's been a few holdings caught up. I mentioned it last time, and it it seems like this Robin Hood or retail investor uh, kind of theme has taken off where everyone picks mm. one stock or gets onto one stock and it sounds great and it just runs incredibly hard. And uh, the first thing I looked at was what the institutions were doing and not one of the institutional investors changed their shareholding. They're just, they see the quality of the company and they're, they're sitting still. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why basically all the, it, it went, there was exuberance. It went too far too quickly and it's back to where it was three months ago. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, um, 
it's as as they've been saying in the media recently this isn't a company that is competing with paypal you know paypal was always going to enter into buy now pay later it wasn't a surprise when it happened mm. um they're they're all taking market share away from credit cards which people are using less and less that's mm. that's the market um and they can't all win uh but they're they're growing incredibly quickly mm. i was so i was talking about this with the team yesterday and probably my my one concern with zip is just because they've acquired a few other companies so i'd want to get to the bottom of how fast it's growing organically I think that the, the purchases, the acquisitions that they've made are strategic and are important to its growth. But I just yeah. want to know, is it, does it have the same um, virality as, say, Afterpay in particular geographies? So you want to break up the segments yeah. once, they're, once they're integrated? Yeah, and know just you know, how quick it's growing with its marketing spend versus its acquisitions. So and yeah. just, just get a sense of that. I think it's growing very quickly. I should probably know before we came on air, but that's just like a general high level thought that I've been thinking lately. Like that's something I want to get to the bottom of. Yeah, because quad pay was a pretty quick one and all, you know, yeah. when you're coming off a low base, 100% sounds like a lot, but it's 100% isn't, you know, it's growing at 100% a year basically at the moment. Yeah, um, which is which is unbelievable. You, it's hard to, I can't think of many other examples. Bit. Yeah, yeah, that would be like that. So that's, that's a really impressive business. And it's found a run, right? Yep. Yeah. So. Larry, is it Larry Diamond and? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's. I find like I still struggle with missing out on Afterpay, uh, but Zip does credit checks. That's what I see. Maybe that caps the growth, but they actually check the credit ratings of their um, customers. Mm -hmm. That that is what kind of impressed me originally. And they also own, I can't remember what it's called, but a cash flow management uh, software mm -hmm. as well. Doesn't make them much yeah. money, but it's. They've got the zip business. Data. Yeah. And launch yeah. a small business unit as well. Yeah. So there's plenty of optionality. And I think that optionality is kind of what will stand the test of time for most of these businesses. And yeah. the banks and the, everyone wants to fund them. So, you know, Australian super, they have this a warehouse trust where they basically have, a, I think it's hmm. a couple of billion dollars sitting in a, in a ro rotating line of credit effectively. Yeah. Um, I think it's Australian super is one of the holders of that. And then a few of the other banks, basically they'll, they'll buy this bond uh, that allows Zip to just keep rotating its its capital. Oh, right, I didn't know that. That's okay. I suppose that's what you can do when you have a lot of money, but um, I guess if you've got that type of um, facility, it's probably pretty sticky, right? Compared to some of the businesses which struggle with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They see, everyone sees the value in the disruption. It's mm. interesting when the, the people it's disrupting are also the ones financing it. <laughs> 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 yeah, do a great job. And then, yeah. oh no. <laughs> um, that's, yeah, really, really good business. Um, $3 billion market cap. So probably the smallest of your caps. Um, yep. But, um, well, Munro is a bit different. But um, you were going to talk about Borrell. And I, maybe I kind of persuaded you with that. But maybe we can talk about that next week. That's uh, good. Um, my last one is a company called Alcidian. So... I've gone from the biggest, one of the biggest companies in the world to a company that is well, tiny, 130 mil market cap. It always so takes what, me a while to Google the ones you come up with. So. <laughs> you have to find them. Um, so Asidian is a business that um, it's small cap. It does uh, software for hospitals and I guess um, medical, what they call them, health systems, where for example, um, imagine you go into a hospital today and there's still those old paper boards that the doctor picks up, you know, at the end of the patient's bed. And then you go down the hallway and then there's that whiteboard where they write all the notes for all of the patients. And this one's going to that ward today and whatever. Well, gone are the days for many hospitals where paper-based, I guess, patient tracking is really the thing. Many of the modern hospitals now, and they're, they're still slow, to, many of them are slow to catch up, but many of the leading hospitals now um, have an electronic health record. So mainly, just, the, mainly the not-profits and the private ones, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You still, like, there's still a lot of hospitals out there, I should say, that are still catching up. But um, if you look at, say, uh, the NHS in uh, the UK, you look in North America, and even here in parts of Australia, um, hospitals are pushing and the governments are pushing towards this electronic health record because then it creates, I guess, a more... Um, infallible or a, a more secure way for patients to be tracked and 
things to be known about them. Well, the next step in that evolution is uh, clinical decision-making systems. So systems which use that electronic um, and, and digital data and then make or help professionals make decisions. So instead of you know, getting your, your bloods checked at the front when you check in, to then going to, or you get admitted, to then going to a different ward and getting your bloods checked again, imagine if you had something plugged into your arm and there's a centralized hub where, you could, uh, where nurses and doctors could oversee the vitals. That's effectively what Alcidian does. It provides that software for um, hospitals and, and health systems throughout the world. And one of the things that we saw during COVID was um, the ability for Alcidian to deliver remote um, care to people because a lot of doctors weren't traveling. They were doing e-health and things like that. This was enabling them to monitor patients remotely from a centralized you know, facility that might be the hospital where they have all the nurses and doctors or even they might even be remote. And so Alcidian is virtually the future of that. It sells via subscriptions or signs long-term contracts with, um, with hospitals. Um, I've got some notes here. So one of the things that this recently signed some contracts with Mar the Murrumbidgee LHD, it signed a two-year contract extension with ACT Health. These are all just in the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, its key product is a, it was a product called Patient Track or is a product called Patient Track, but that's since been integrated with the broader suite of products. Um, it, ha it has mobile apps, it has iPad apps and things for in hospitals. And so basically that's what it does. I know you've got some information on this, Drew, because I believe your other half might um, know something about this industry. She knows a lot about the industry, but there's no apps uh, where she works. Um, it's all like we saw, uh, I won't get political, but uh, fax machines still being used in a, in a lot of hospitals as well. So any sort of software, I think, that would assist with you know, making these handover processes and, and sharing of patients between units would be, you know, it's incredibly valuable. I think we say every week you make someone's job or someone's uh, work easier or their life easier uh, and you're incredibly valuable. Yeah. And that's the thing. So a lot of the hospitals are still um, pretty backwards. They'll have a different piece of software when a, when a patient comes through the emergency department and then a dis different piece of software if they're, I don't know, in a different ward of the hospital, then a different piece of software for, you know, for this scan at this part of the hospital, but the same scan at the other part, it runs on a different piece of software. Yeah. And so that's just because hospitals over time have been so scared to change um, their, their software. Because if they have to roll in this new software, it has to have maximum uptime, right? Like you can't afford to have the software change overnight and go down because yeah. that means lives. And they're just not prepared to do that. So you end up with this kind of mismatch of, different pieces of software, but we still see some of the big ERP players dominating this space. So things like SAP um, yeah. or, or divisions of SAP, sorry. So you, you do have that, but what we're starting to see with some of these smaller businesses, if they can prove their, their product um, in particular hospitals, then the other hospitals are, are pretty fast followers. So they observe who goes first, let the trailblazers go, and then they follow in behind. They think, oh, they've saved a lot of money. That's been that's a good outcome for them. Let's kind of do what they're doing. And um, I think that's where we're getting to with our city. And I won't say it's out of the woods yet. It's a business that, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it makes a capital raising. Um, they have shown acquisition behavior in the past. Um, it's, it's, I actually spoke to the CEO um, or managing director, Kate Quirk, not long ago. Um, and she kind of, in my opinion, when you speak to a manager and the first thing they talk about is products or people, that's when it gets really exciting for me because you can see how passionate they are. And that's what I really look for in people. Whereas if they go straight to the, this is the total addressable market. Here's our latest financial results. And this is what we plan to do next quarter. I kind of get a bit, uh, you know, I want you to be, I want you to have vision. You're the leader of this company. So yeah. Alcidian comes with a lot of risk. We've talked about small cap companies, Drew. Very small parts of portfolios require you to do a lot of work. Um, like I said, this business could re require a capital raising. Um, it's pretty lumpy in particularly in COVID because of the selling process for selling software isn't exactly easy. What so, can it get to? Could it be a billion dollar company? That's, I think the, the, what people don't think about enough, I think is when you have a business that has have such sticky software is that there is a point to how sticky it can, can be because if it's too sticky, it's such a slow grower. And yeah. I, I think that that would be pretty optimistic 
Now I'm going to, someone's going to listen to this whole conversation. They're going to pull out these few words to it, but I could see it being a company that's has a market cap of two or 300 million yeah. where it's currently 130. Whether that, yeah. whether it takes five years, I don't know. Whether it takes 10 years, I don't know. But it could be something that SAP buys to augment their, their work as, some, as something as well. That's it. You know, there always, there's always big parties looking in the, in the health tech space to try and, or med tech space to try and get um, you know, a bit of extra reach on hospitals or what have you. But I think it's a really good business. I'm glad to see that they're consolidating their brands because they have all these different brands and they're bringing them into one slightly bigger cost base, the way they calculated, um, oh, this is a little nerdy thing, but the way they calculated their gross margins was a little bit, we thought it was a little bit strange because they included sales and marketing in the gross margin, yep. which I've never seen before. So they're going to change that. Um, so a few things that to look out for there, but I think it's a good little business, add it to your watch list um, and do some further research. Excellent. Cool. Um, and that was that. That's a wrap, mate. Um, I think we've, was, I don't even know how long that was, maybe 40 minutes so far. Six companies, or well, six ideas. We're doing pretty well. Getting better. Kept on time. Yeah. Um, cool, mate. Well, I'm guessing you'll be back next week. So, Drew Meredith from Model Partners, I'll put links in the show notes for people to email you. Um, I'll make that public so you get 100 emails from spammers over the next 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but no, as always, Drew, thanks for joining me, mate. Thank you. And watch out for our uh, podcast and uh, I think video series coming soon. Yes. Yes. Um, not, interview, not with you. <laughs> not with me. I won't be there. So, you know, it will actually be a bit more professional, but you've actually got a lot of interviews and we, we, we put this in the show notes last week, but it was, we took us a bit of time to do it. Um, well, I'll put it in the show notes today on time. Go to, to the link in the show notes because there's a, there's a link there where you can register for Drew's, interviews with fund managers and, it's, um, and and Jamie. So it's really interesting. It's free, right? Yep. Completely free. All yep. via Zoom. Yep. Cool. Get on that. Um, we'll put it in the show notes if you want to hear from some of these great fund managers because you had Magellan last week, I think it was. Yeah. Magellan Infrastructure, Gerald Stack. And then we had Tom King from Nanook uh, yep. this week. And we've got, I think you've interviewed Cameron Brownjohn from Federation yep. uh, this week. Yeah. So some fantastic thinkers in that mix. So, um, and one every week or one every is it every week until the end of the year? Every week till the end of the year. Oh, good on you. Keeping uh... <laughs> keep ourselves busy. Yeah. So I'll put links in the show notes to that. So you can find out how to reach Drew and you can get on, in, on board some of those uh, videos. Drew, mate, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Cool. <laughs> you too. <laughs>